Publishing Incorporated, Denver, Colorado, presents the Get Acquainted series, introducing authors and places in American literature. This unit, written by Paul Friesen, introduces Henry David Thoreau. In this unit, you will learn who Thoreau was, where and when he lived, why he built his small house at Walden Pond, and why his life was dedicated to freedom and equality for all people. In this series of visuals, you will visit the places where Thoreau lived and wrote. Thoreau demonstrated the virtues of individuality and nonconformity. Within his idealism, he maintained a strong sense of responsibility to his family and friends. In a society which was beginning to feel the pulse of industrial progress, Thoreau challenged the growing clamor for material possessions. He questioned the desirability of wealth claiming that a simple, uncluttered life was more desirable. To drive his point home, he lived alone for about two years in a small house which he built on the shores of Walden Pond. Thoreau was born on July 12, 1817, the son of a pencil manufacturer. He grew up and lived all his life in the vicinity of Concord, Massachusetts. The small village of Concord had already gained fame as the first inland settlement of the Puritans in 1635, as the site of the opening battle of the Revolutionary War in 1775, and in Thoreau's time as the home of several of America's distinguished authors. The old North Bridge, where the Revolutionary War started, spans the Concord River at the north edge of town. Emerson's house stands near Concord Center, and Walden Pond lies about one and a half miles south of the center of town. Thoreau graduated from Harvard in 1837, taught school with his brother John for a time, and worked in his father's pencil manufacturing firm. During much of his life, he utilized his special skills in gardening, farming, surveying, and house painting, jobs which challenged his physical abilities. Emerson described him as being equipped with the most adapted and serviceable body. He was of short stature, firmly built, of light complexion. His senses were acute, his frame well knit and hardy, his hands strong and skillful in the use of tools. Thoreau was a frequent guest in Emerson's home, eating many of his meals there and having his own room on the second floor of the big white frame house. In this house, Literary-minded people such as Margaret Fuller, William Channing, George Ripley, and, of course, Thoreau met to explore new and changing ideas in religion, literature, and philosophy. Thoreau became caretaker of the family and of the house and yard for two years while Emerson was on his second trip to Europe. The family consisted of Lydian Emerson and the three Emerson children, whom Thoreau enjoyed entertaining. Thoreau's influence as an author has been exerted mainly through two of his works, the book Walden, published in 1854, and the long essay, Civil Disobedience. Both present his nonconformist views, his pleas for simplicity in living, and his concern for freedom and dignity in all human relationships. The essay, Civil Disobedience, developed as a result of a night Thoreau spent in this jail. He explained, I have paid no poll tax for six years. I was put into a jail once on this account for one night. I did not for a moment feel confined, and the wall seemed a great waste of stone and mortar. I felt as if I alone of all my townsmen had paid my tax. He refused to pay the poll tax as a gesture against slavery, and because he did not want to support the Mexican War, which he believed was being fought to expand slaveholding territory for the United States. In Walden, Thoreau expressed the highest ideals which he believed man needs to achieve in order to live satisfactorily. In order to experience his own idealism, Thoreau lived for about two years in a small house on the north shore of Walden Pond. Thoreau's idealism touched the areas of economics, 
personal relationships, nature, eating habits, and his own form of religion. In his brief withdrawal from urban society, he lived alone in his small house. In the opening chapter of Walden, entitled Economy, he wrote, When I wrote the following pages, or rather the bulk of them, I lived alone in the woods, a mile from any neighbor, in a house which I had built myself on the shore of Walden Pond in Concord, Massachusetts, and earned my living by the labor of my hands only. I lived there two years and two months. This reproduction of Thoreau's house stands on the grounds of the Thoreau Lyceum in Concord. Thoreau was prompted to carry out his experiment not only because of his love for nature and his nonconformist views, but also because he was distressed over the death of his brother John. A friend, Ellery Channing, wrote to Thoreau telling him to build himself a little house and to find out what life was really all about. Shortly after this communication, Thoreau began his building project by borrowing an axe and selecting a site for his house. The site is marked today by stone posts encompassing the area of the house. Dense woods still give the feeling of separation from close neighbors which Thoreau was seeking. However, Thoreau had the privilege of entertaining many visitors at his home in the woods. In Walden, he wrote, Near the end of March, 1845, I borrowed an axe and went down to the woods by Walden Pond, nearest to where I intended to build my house and began to cut down some tall, arrowy white pines for timber. It was a pleasant hillside where I worked, covered with pine woods through which I looked out on the pond. The thick woods almost blocked Thoreau's view of the pond, which in this scene is barely visible through the trees. My house was on the side of a hill, immediately on the edge of the larger wood, in the midst of a young forest of pitch pines and hickories, and half a dozen rods from the pond to which a narrow footpath led down the hill. I went on for some days cutting and hewing timber and also studs and rafters, all with my narrow axe. I hewed the main timber six inches square, most of the studs on two sides only, and the rafters and floor timbers on one side, leaving the rest of the bark on so that they were just as straight and much stronger than sawed ones. Each stick was carefully mortised or tenoned by its stump. Thoreau's craftsmanship was also evident in the construction of the chimney. He wrote, Before boarding the house, I laid the foundation of a chimney at one end, bringing two cartloads of stones up the hill from the pond in my arms. I built the chimney after my hoeing in the fall, before a fire became necessary for warmth. Later, in the chapter called Housewarming, he wrote, when I came to build my chimney, I studied masonry. My bricks, being second-hand ones, required to be cleaned with a trowel so that I learned more than usual of the qualities of bricks and trowels. I lingered most about the fireplace as the most vital part of the house. Indeed, I worked so deliberately that though I commenced at the ground in the morning, a course of bricks raised a few inches above the floor served for my pillow at night. I was pleased to see my work rising so square and solid by degrees and reflected that if it proceeded slowly, it was calculated to endure a long time. I began to occupy my house on the 4th of July as soon as it was boarded and roofed, for the boards were carefully feather-edged and lapped so that it was perfectly impervious to rain. I have thus a tight shingled and plastered house, 10 feet wide by 15 long, and eight feet posts, with a garret and a closet, a large window on each side, two trap doors, one door at the end, and a brick fireplace opposite. The surrounding forest offered plenty of firewood. Thoreau's philosophical mind turned the chore of wood chopping into a satisfying exercise as he realized that the wood he cut warmed him twice, once while he was chopping it, and again while he was burning it in his fireplace. He stored his firewood in a small wood shed behind the house. As he stated in Walden, I have also a small wood shed adjoining, made chiefly of the stuff which was left after building the house. The interior was modestly furnished as displayed in this model in the Thoreau Lyceum. He explained, my furniture, part of which I made myself, 
and the rest cost me nothing of which I have not rendered an account. In this reproduction of the room at the antiquarian house in Concord are displayed the desk, bed, and chair which Thoreau used in his Walden house. Also included in this room are his snowshoes, walking stick, and a surveyor's chain. The exact cost of my house, paying the usual price for such materials as I used, but not counting the work, all of which was done by myself, was $28.12.5. I intend to build me a house which will surpass any on the main street in Concord in grandeur and luxury, as soon as it pleases me as much and will cost me no more than my present one. He believed that man can live satisfactorily and happily with four basic necessities food, shelter, clothing, and fuel, occupying his time with three pastimes, reading, thinking, and studying nature. Thoreau lived in this house at Walden Pond for two years, two months, and two days, living not as a hermit seeking to escape society, but as a scientist experimenting with the basic elements of life. In his explanation for the experiment, he said, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not when I came to die discover that I had not lived. I did not wish to live what was not life. Living is so dear, nor did I wish to practice resignation unless it was quite necessary. I wanted to live deep and suck out all the marrow of life, to drive life into a corner and reduce it to its lowest terms. And if it proved to be mean, why then to get the whole and genuine meanness of it and publish its meanness to the world? Or if it were sublime, to know it by experience and be able to give a true account of it in my next excursion. He believed that man should simplify his existence, reduce his wants, and avoid luxuries. He stated, an honest man has hardly need to count more than his ten fingers, or in extreme cases, he may add his ten toes and lump the rest. Simplicity, simplicity, simplicity. I say, let your affairs be as two or three, and not a hundred or a thousand. Instead of a million, count half a dozen, and keep your accounts on your thumbnail. Thoreau's choice of a site on which he built his house was well suited to carry out his philosophy of simplicity. As he described it, I was seated by the shore of a small pond, about a mile and a half south of the village of Concord, and somewhat higher than it, in the midst of an extensive wood between that town and Lincoln, and about two miles south of that our only field known to fame, Concord Battleground. I was so low in the woods that the opposite shore, half a mile off, like the rest, covered with wood, was my most distant horizon. In Walden, he described the scenery as being on a humble scale, and though very beautiful, does not approach to grandeur, nor can it much concern one who has not long frequented it or lived by its shore. Yet this pond is so remarkable for its depth and purity as to merit a particular description. It is a clear and deep green well, half a mile long and a mile and three quarters in circumference, and contains about sixty-one and a half acres, a perennial spring in the midst of pine and oak woods, without any visible inlet or outlet, except by the clouds and evaporation. The surrounding hills rise abruptly from the water to the height of forty to eighty feet, though on the southeast and east they attain to about 100 and 150 feet respectively, within a quarter and a third of a mile. They are exclusively woodland. The water is so transparent that the bottom can easily be discerned at the depth of 25 or 30 feet. Paddling over it, you may see many feet beneath the surface the schools of perch and shiners, perhaps only an inch long. It is nowhere muddy, and a casual observer would say that there were no weeds at all in it. The stones extend a rod or two into the water, and then the bottom is pure sand, except in the deepest parts, where there is usually a little sediment. Thoreau enjoyed the solitude of Walden, and except for an occasional visitor, 
Animal as well as man, he was seldom disturbed. In the chapter entitled Solitude, Thoreau said he found it wholesome to be alone the greater part of the time. I love to be alone. I never found the companion that was so companionable as solitude. As a lone tree stands out from the others in the woods, Thoreau stood alone among his colleagues and townsmen. He practiced the transcendental nonconformity and self-reliance which Emerson preached. Emerson said of him, no opposition or ridicule had any weight with him. He coldly and fully stated his opinion without affecting to believe that it was the opinion of the company. It was of no consequence if everyone present held the opposite opinion. While the nation was basking in the promise of progress and easier living as a result of the Industrial Revolution, Thoreau held back, not willing to accept machinery as the cure-all for the nation's ills. In fact, he saw the railroad and the telegraph as evil burdens placed upon the backs of society and as spoilers of natural beauty. He commented, the nation lives too fast. Men think that it is essential that the nation have commerce and export ice and talk through a telegraph and ride 30 miles an hour. In a tone of mild sarcasm, he stated, if we do not get out sleepers and forge rails and devote days and nights to the work, but go to tinkering upon our lives to improve them, who will build railroads? And if railroads are not built, how shall we get to heaven in season? But if we stay at home and mind our business, who will want railroads? We do not ride on the railroad, it rides upon us. From his house in the woods, Thoreau could hear the trains across the pond. In the chapter called Sounds, he wrote, the Fitchburg Railroad cuts through the woods about a hundred rods south of where I dwell. I usually go to the village along its causeway. The whistle of the locomotive penetrates my woods summer and winter, sounding like the scream of a hawk sailing over some farmer's yard. Thoreau left the woods for as good a reason as he went there. Perhaps it seemed to me, he said, that I had several more lives to live and could not spare any more time for that one. It is remarkable how easily and insensibly we fall into a particular route and make a beaten track for ourselves. Thoreau's sojourn in the woods was, after all, an experiment. From it he learned that if one advances confidently in the direction of his dreams and endeavors to live the life which he has imagined, he will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. In proportion, as he simplifies his life, the laws of the universe will appear less complex. Speaking directly to the readers, he stated, if you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now, put the foundations under them. Walden is, then, the record of Thoreau's experiment. It is a book important, among many other things, for three aspects. First, it is an accurate account of natural life in the woods. Second, it presents the beliefs and philosophies of a man who was able to stand aside and look at society from an external view. And third, it contains a general plea for honesty and simplicity as a way of achieving satisfaction in life. Thoreau was not a recluse. With Concord as his home base, he traveled to many places, such as Cape Cod, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, and on one occasion to Minnesota. As a professional lecturer, he went as far away as Philadelphia, and as a surveyor, he worked in New Jersey. In his final years, he participated with his family in the abolitionist movement with its underground railway. He was a strong defender of anti-slavery attitudes and actions, supporting especially the radical activities of John Brown. Thoreau died of tuberculosis in 1862 at the age of 44. His final resting place in the family burial plot in Sleepy Hollow Cemetery in Concord is an appropriate memorial to Thoreau's love for nature with its peaceful and eternal qualities. The placement of his gravestone in the left rear corner of the family plot is somehow symbolic of his humility and love for simplicity. His life exemplified the independence and nonconformity of the transcendental philosophy in which he strongly believed. 
Although he gained little popularity in his own time, he has since become a leading spokesman in man's search for equal rights, freedom from governmental restraints, and independence in acting and thinking. His independence is borne out in his often quoted expression of individuality. He said, if a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer. Let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away. In his own time, he marched almost alone. Since then, especially in the 1960s, his anti-materialistic and close-to-nature lifestyle has been admired and often imitated. His influence continues to grow, and his genius continues to inspire people of many nations, even as it influenced and inspired Emerson. Emerson's tribute to Thoreau praises him for his knowledge in both intellectual and physical skills but it also laments the lack of ambition which Thoreau apparently displayed. Emerson wrote, had his genius been only contemplative, he had been fitted to his life, but with his energy and practical ability, he seemed born for great enterprise and for command. And I so much regret the loss of his rare powers of action that I cannot help counting it a fault in him that he had no ambition. Nevertheless, Emerson admired and respected him, characterizing him as an individualist, a hermit and stoic, a speaker and actor of the truth, a master of common sense, a personification of sincerity and accuracy, and a true American. In a eulogistic style, Emerson said, the country knows not yet, or in the least part, how great a son it has lost. His soul was made for the noblest society. He had in a short life exhausted the capabilities of this world. Wherever there is knowledge, wherever there is virtue, wherever there is beauty, he will find a home. <laughs>